Parker, expected approach time 34, approach button 17, the altimeter 29 or 9 or 7. Well, welcome back to the channel, everyone. I'm your host, Prickly Hedgehog, and here we are. Another Friday. Another sit rep on things going on DCS World related, and it is yet another exciting week. Because once again, we get to discuss a Hercules, another aircraft being released, some bug fixes and adjustments to the Mirage F1, an avionics crash for the F-16 has been repaired, and we have some significant updates to Heaplos F-14 along with a few other surprises along the way. So stick around. Here we go. Let's begin with the big news on a brand new full fidelity aircraft, or at least one new to becoming a professional module and full fidelity aircraft. And that is the announcement that the C-130J is now going to be a monetized. Now it's produced by Airplane Simulation Company. And this logistics aircraft is going to bring a whole new form of flying in DCS world that we have not previously seen. Indeed, ED's core business has always been focused on combat flight simulation. There's less appeal for these kinds of aircraft. And I think if you'd asked five years ago if ED would explore this kind of plane for the game, they'd probably have said it's an interesting idea, but it doesn't fit our focus. Times have clearly changed, for the good, I might add. Initially, I suspected that this aircraft was one that appealed to a fairly niche group within the community, and thus it was initially a free mod. But as the player base has grown, and the aircraft continues to have been worked on, and more people have dipped into the flight sim genre with an interest in larger aircraft, the appeal of a heavy lift aircraft is not only lofted beyond a niche appeal, it's now mainstream, and furthermore, there is enough support to justify making it a full fidelity module and a pay for one as well. In other words, simply, there is a player base now that we haven't had in the past. And it's going to provide a much different in-game experience than the fast jet one. And what it means for the future is support, I think, for more heavy aircraft like this in the game to support logistics operations, refueling, or to embellish our playing experiences in cooperative PvP and PvE environments. Again, I think it's a fantastic thing. Airplane Simulation Company and ED will be offering us the J model initially, which is an upgraded airframe, a glass cockpit, air-to-ground radar, FMS, and computerized airdrop capabilities, which are designed to reduce crew workload, they say. Now, I believe, unless I'm very much mistaken, FMS means foreign military sales. So if I'm wrong there, and this is out of context, let me know. And uh, obviously, you know, I'm just double-checking here, but... Obviously, this is an aircraft that's used extensively by the U.S. Air Force and also many other air forces around the world. So FMS on that basis, I believe, has some contextual relevance. But if I'm out of order here, let me know. Or if I'm wrong, let me know. Now, they are adding other variants as well. There's no word, of course, on the gunship version at this stage, which, of course, would be a pretty sophisticated module given the complexity of the weapons available on it, some of which I don't believe we have modeled right now. Now, there will be KC variants, however, and that is really exciting to have an air-to-air -air refueling option. It's going to allow, I think, some virtual squadrons the ability to do some better training rather than relying on the AI module to fill that role. We could actually have some people who could do air-to-air -air refueling and maybe help compensate a little bit for some of the maneuvering that you see with the uh, AI, which can be a little uh, tricky. And it's uh, obviously there's no communication of, obviously with the tanker uh, when it's changing lanes, if you like, or moving around a little bit more. Having a uh, co-op situation is going to be really, really useful. So we'll see how that evolves in the game in the future. Dallas traffic, uh, Venom flight, flight to F-16, Hong Kong, taxi to active, uh, zero 03, right, takeoff, departure, Dallas. Turning to something a little bit different, Flare and ED have software in the game which mimics our Flare systems on the aircraft that support it. And they have advised that they have done some more tweaks or further tweaks to the Flare system. They continue to improve texture for ground units and ships to match the real life Flare signatures. They also aim to adjust the 
aircraft flare signatures at different times of day and in varying thermal conditions, which is pretty cool. Flare rendering of terrain elements such as building windows and civilian traffic are also being improved. There are many improvements taking place, and I'm pleased to see this. We noticed actually uh, with some recent CSAR training with the Air Warfare Group that certain objects could be a little difficult to pick out with the Warthog's flare. I suspect that these updates will be highly beneficial for our upcoming missions on the Syria map as well over the fall and winter, which we'll be bringing you some little snippets of as the weeks wear on. So stay tuned for that. Let me know what you think of the flare updates and if they've been an improvement or if you've noticed uh, uh, any frustration with that, with the lack of, I guess, contrast that sometimes kicks in uh, with certain objects. Now, there was a little patch update this week that fixed a number of features, including an avionics crash with the F-16, which is a good thing to have rectified. Obviously, the F-16 is really moving along right now in terms of updates, which is exciting news. Of note, though, were a couple of big adjustments to aircraft, including the Mirage F-1 and the F-14 Tomcat. Starting with the Mirage, they did a lot of work on the flight model. They have increased yaw and pitch dampness strength following SME fade feedback which is pretty cool they fixed the bug introduced in the previous update now i forget what that bug was i think it was a your issue of some kind nonetheless i didn't notice it too bad because i didn't really get into flying the mirage all that much but again a nice thing to uh, fix adjusted thrust at very high speeds and low altitude they've added a new type of partial engine failure not sure exactly what that is it doesn't go into detail here they have improved anti-slip behavior, again, following SME feedback. They've fixed mass handling issues after refueling and when dropping the external fuel tanks, which is pretty cool. Uh, flight model tweaks related to pitch, abnormal behavior at very negative AOA. They have adjusted the drag coefficient at very negative AOA, the pitch coefficient behavior at extreme AOA, and adjusted your coefficient at extreme AOA. So again, they... They also did some texture adjustments to the 3D model and, of course, the interior cockpit, which was overly dark when the aircraft was initially released because they were trying to mimic the aeroplastic from 70s and 80s. They've now been able to lighten this up successfully, which I think is a big, big improvement, I must say. And uh, after employed the team for the work that they're doing on this aircraft, it's a pretty fantastic addition to the game and a lot of fun to fly. And a little bit of a challenge. It's uh, again, we don't have to fly by wire stuff on this uh, aircraft. So, yeah, and it presents some interesting challenges. And I wish I had more time to fly it. Now, Heat Blue has announced that they have added or overhauled at least part two to the Phoenix missiles. I guess that's both. They've added part two of their overhaul to the Phoenix missiles, is what I was trying to say. And that's a process that has increased the realism, they hope. Uh, based on additional information available to them. And these things include, they have increased the PN navigation for all variants. I believe that stands for proportional navigation, which is also a shipping principle. And the idea is that, uh, you know, in shipping, obviously, you're trying to avoid um, collisions. Uh, in missile uh, terms, we are trying to um, make collisions. So it's a mechanism for... Um, calculating the way in which a missile is going to uh, stay on target, if you like, and collide um, or get near enough to do a proximity explosion to damage or take out the other aircraft. Now, the AIM-54A will now only update guidance when the target is illuminated. You will see the missile periodically update, which is really cool. They have corrected motor impulse, so they've reduced the Mark 47 a bit and the Mark 60 significantly. They have reduced the Mark 60 burn time from 30 to 20 seconds. Both motors have the same impulse now. The Mark 60 has a slight advantage during motor burn time, uh, while the Mark 47 has an advantage in burn time. With increasing altitude, the difference becomes smaller. The Mark 47 Mod 1 has now the same thrust impulse and burn time as the Mod 0, but with reduced smoke, was uh, previously weaker than the Mod 0. The AIM-54C should go active by default, even when losing the lock from STT. They have increased the AIM-54C chaff resistance. They have reduced the AIM-54A chaff resistance. They've added option for AIM-54C with Mark 60 motors. And they've adjusted the AIM-54 missile empty mass, and they've adjusted the Mark 60 motor propellant mass. So there is more detailed information about this missile behavior on their forums page. 
I'd uh, encourage you to check that out if you're looking to learn a little bit more. I'm going to stress here that this is pretty sophisticated number crunching. A lot of work has gone into this, so I have to congratulate the team on their efforts here. And interestingly enough, uh, just by coincidence, Ward Carroll did a video this week on the former naval personnel who many years ago leaked secrets to the Soviets about these AIM-54 missiles' behavior. And it essentially basically forced the manufacturers to rewrite the software and how the missiles operated, which uh, was a story I wasn't actually familiar with. So it was a pretty interesting one. Now, that history, I don't believe, directly bears an impact on DCS, but it's nonetheless interesting in terms of the physics behind, the math behind making sure these missiles hit their target, especially when coupled with ECM interference. And that discussion came up a little bit with uh, that video with Ward Carroll and his guest and some of the stuff they obviously skirted around in terms of secrecy, uh, you could tell. Uh, even today, uh, some of this stuff is uh, is guarded. So again, interesting, interesting stuff and cool to have elements of this mimicked uh, in a way that represents uh, what we expect the missiles to do in uh, in the real world and uh, that's uh, that's cool stuff so what does it mean well in short of course the a variant missile isn't quite as sophisticated if you like or as reliable perhaps uh, than the c variant and it requires a little bit more tracking data from the aircraft uh, it was launched from uh, and the c model is typically basically a lot smarter. Now, I haven't had a chance to play with this yet, so it will be a fun experiment. Let me know if you have had any experiences with it and what those experiences were. Now, the team included a couple of other fixes as well. I won't go through all of them for obvious reasons because we'll be here forever, but uh, they did include some Mark buffeting that wasn't dissipating after Mark 1.3, among a few other nifty fixes and improvements. And it's good to see the continued development of the F-14, which is a really a mighty aircraft. It's still one of my favorites to fly. It's, you know, not highly sophisticated in terms of avionics. It is a uh, sophisticated plane. It's a challenging thing to fly. It's big. It's heavy. Um, it's got a lot of hydraulic complex systems. Um, but it's a hell of a lot of fun to fly. And it looks amazing, too. And it will challenge you as a pilot. So, you know... It's worth, worth trying out if you're a fan of the F-14. If you haven't had a chance, you know, to do a trial, maybe pick it up. And stay tuned for more information on the development of this, along with some other heat blow products that uh, we're eagerly awaiting as well. Now, we're not related to the F-14 uh, and not discussed in any of, recent, of the recent patches in terms of fixes, but the Air Warfare Group and I expressed a little bit of frustration with the air-to-air -air tech and not working in multiplayer servers which does inhibit, uh, to some degree, locating the tanker. Obviously, you could find it with the radar and all the rest of it. But there are some aircraft, I understand, like the A-10, that does use the TACAN to find the tanker. Now, it seems to have sailed off course many patches ago. I'm not sure which particular patch caused this um, irritation. And it is only a minor one, but it is uh, still one that you know kind of bugs you from time to time. So we're not sure exactly when this went uh, a little bit haywire. If you have any clues about that, and if you know any information about possible fixes, or if ED has said anything about it, let me know in the comments section below, because it is one that we would like to get addressed, because we do use tankers in our training, and we do use the TACAN to help us... Uh, Help us get there. So, all right. Kind of rounding out this week's video and broader news, we do have uh, another pending release of yet another module. And in this case, we're talking about the OV-10A Bronco. Looks pretty sophisticated. And from what I understand of a recent uh, interview, this is going to be a full fidelity clicky cockpit in the future. Now, uh, in the theme of Cold War aircraft, especially ones used in Vietnam, this, uh, I guess, really does kind of fit in perfect keeping with many other announcements that we've had lately. Now, it's produced by Split Air and Daikonek, I believe is the pronunciation there. Uh, and I'm really, really looking forward to what they're doing. It will be a pretty interesting little aircraft. It's going to have some appeal, I think, with a maybe more of a niche, but it's going to be a delightful little thing. And maybe a little bit of an interesting experience. It obviously is a, a spotter plane. It does uh, was designed to uh, conduct reconnaissance as well as being capable of dropping bombs and missiles and or at least I believe missiles and also rockets as well as other um, functions that it had. So yeah, it's a delightful little aircraft and they did a neat little episode um, fighter pilot podcast a while back um, if you haven't heard that that is a really 
neat episode. If you're a fan of the plane, I encourage you to listen to that. And also the Split Air team did a little launch video, a little cinem uh, cinematic for it as well. So it's a pretty exciting little addition to the game and it contributes to some aircraft that are of high interest and that is these light attack aircraft so let me know what you think of this bronco edition i'm kind of curious to see how it comes about and from what i can tell it's a pretty well done module uh aesthetically it looks really good so we'll have to wait and see what the future holds and what it uh, looks like when we get to go out there and fly it and uh if it becomes one of those uh pay or monetized versions in the future who's to say Contact ground targets shooting up at us, uh, northeast side of the airfield. How copy? Alpha one copies northeast side of the airfield. We'll uh, blow north and come in for a closer look. Awesome. Uh, we're gonna go. We're flowing north too. We've got you in sight. We're low. Your four o'clock now. We're gonna be climbing north 10,000 feet, pushing up to our assigned altitude 18. All copies. Well, Roseban continues to tease us with images of the F-15E, which I'm hoping is nearing some sort of early access release date in quarter four. Fingers crossed. I speculated that this could be a blockbuster sale for the team, and really is, that isn't a difficult guess with how much popularity the module has from the community. And it will add yet another two-person aircraft to the growing stable of cooperative play aircraft that we have in game, which includes obviously several helicopters now, the Mosquito, and of course the F-14, which has already been plugged in this episode. While the E won't rival the C for air superiority and BFM and BVR type activities exclusively, its ability to multi-role in some capacity will have massive appeal in conjunction with cooperative play as mentioned. It will be capable in BVR, but that is in its primary role, of course. Now, it will join the Phantom, which will be Heat Blur's second two-person aircraft. So we have quite a lot of options to choose from, even without considering now these heavy aircraft developers may try to launch in the future. We've got a lot going on. Now, Razbam also showcased a couple of other images of its MiG-23, which is another eagerly awaited airframe, especially to those on the Enigma server, whose players are hoping to deploy it in the vicious COBOL battles against their rivals on those servers. It's a desperately needed addition to the RID4 team's arsenal, which is obviously outweighed right now by the number of Western aircraft that we have at our disposal. So fingers crossed we get some more news there in the future. Stay tuned. Let me know what you think. Well, I think this brings us to the end of another DCS SIP rep. Thanks for joining me once again. My voice is starting to crack here. Don't forget to like, comment, share or support the channel a little bit more with the super thanks again if you enjoyed the episode and it's not compulsory take care everyone out there i enjoy all the feedback carry on flying this is prickly hedgehog out we'll see you next time on the dcs situation report <laughs>